follow the Broadcasting Network, a divine voice out of Africa. Remember to like, to subscribe and to click the bell. Um, what we're going to talk about now is one of the focuses, not just of my um, the presentation tonight, but this has literally been a big part of my career when I was working in public health. This is one of the major things we talk about in the United States is about health disparities. For the students that are here, especially those that want to go into healthcare later on, it is a subject that you, you really have to um, understand because it is literally at the, really at the forefront of a lot of the work that's being done. And if you don't get it, um, it really is difficult to serve populations. In talking to Dr. Glant about the clinic here, um, you know, this being a, a rural clinic designation, it means that you are able to take care of lower income people. I'm gonna deal with this from a racial perspective because when you listen on the news, that's what they talk about, that's what they're thinking about the most. But I don't want you to miss the fact that also, Disparities also apply across socioeconomic boundaries. I had to, I'll maybe I'll tell a story about my time working in rural Alabama, um, but the disparities aren't just racial. They're also majorly related to income. So we'll use race as an example. As I tell my university students, I teach a doctoral level uh, at, a, at one of the universities in Connecticut. Um, if you understand how this works against black people, you will understand how it works against everyone. And if you can fix it for the black population, guess what? You can actually fix it for everyone. And that's why this talk is really so important. So let's just pray before we start. Father God, we just ask for your spirit, for your discernment as we go into this very important topic for uh, the work of health in this country and around the world. Uh, bless us now, Lord. Help us give us clarity and show us your truth through this. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So. I would start with this slide, and when I was working in, in Los Angeles County, this was um, one of the projects that was done. It was a life expectancy project. If you live in Los Angeles County, and you wanted to live a long life, you should be born an Asian female. Because Asian females outlive everyone else at 86.9 years on average life expectancy up front. The shortest life expectancy was black men. Only black men in Los Angeles County are not expected to live to see 70 years of age. These disparities are what you're hearing about. And there is a lot of talk about it. And a lot of people might get mad that we discuss it, but I want you to get, when it comes to the work of health and the health message, here is an opportunity, as I'll show you. So anybody know what city train system this is? Washington, D.C. You know how many times places go in the country, nobody knows that. So very good. Um, and of course, unlike most, most of California, this is a very robust train system. If you look down in this area, this is near the capital. Down in this area, this is the suburbs of Maryland. And what you find is that when you travel from this part of town over to the suburbs, big changes in life expectancy happen in our nation's capital. With each mile you travel from the Capitol Heights Station out towards the Shady Grove Station in Maryland, where I was pointing, and I'll show you that up close in a second, with each mile you travel, life expectancy increases by about a year and a half. So what you're told is that what matters most is your genetic code. What I'm gonna tell you is that that is not true. What matters most is your zip code. <laughs> from a very practical standpoint, it is just, it's where you live. Um, and so here's the Shady uh, Grove Station out in Maryland. Uh, the average suburbanite near the Shady Grove Station will live 20 years longer than the typical city dweller around Capitol Heights. Now, what our people, and I'm gonna show you that when you break this down, if you understand epidemiology and biostatistics, you'll know that this is actually not supposed to happen. Um, and I'll show you more of that in a second. If I move this thing in. Okay, I gotta stop touching the podium is what it is. Um, and so uh, you're gonna find that, that that's not the case. And I'm, I'm gonna show you the science behind this. Um, so there are serious disparities. Um, as, uh, most of us are aware of this gentleman here. He's a very famous Hollywood actor, Chadwick Boseman. 
Um, he, he played Jackie Robinson, um, portrayed the great baseball player who broke the color lines. Jackie Robinson, uh, the film I think was called 42. He played James Brown, he played Thur uh, Thurgood Marshall. He's most famous probably for playing Marvel's The Black Panther. But he died at 42 years old of colon cancer. Shocking, so rich and still died early. 42 years old, died of colon cancer. That's shocking to us as doctors because you would, not have, you would not have suggested to him to get a colonoscopy or do a cologuard or do anything at 35, which is when this cancer clearly would have uh, probably begun uh, to grow in his body. So it's a scary thought uh, that when you look at it, um, People are dying this early. So from 2014 to 2018, African-American men were 1.2 times and 1.5 times, respectively, more likely to have new cases of colon and prostate cancer as compared to non-Hispanic white men. Black and African-American men have five-year five cancer survival rates for most cancer uh, sites, lower five-year survival rates, uh, as compared to white men. Black men are twice as likely to die from prostate cancer as white men. Now, I don't have time to get into all of this, but there's great study that shows that a whole food plant-based diet can actually reverse prostate cancer. Actually reverse it, which is kind of a, to show you where we're going in this talk. This is uh, Hoda, I don't know how to pronounce it, Kota, uh, maybe I spelled it wrong, Kota. Well, she, everyone knows her from Good Morning America, one of those shows. Um, Hoda, um, and she was diagnosed with cancer at 43, breast cancer. Uh, African-American women were just as likely to have been diagnosed with breast cancer. However, they are, were almost 40% more likely to die from breast cancer compared to white women. These are what we call health disparities. African-American adults are 60% more likely than non-Hispanic white adults to be diagnosed with diabetes by a physician. In 2017, non-Hispanic blacks were 3.2 times more likely to be diagnosed with end-stage renal disease as compared to non-Hispanic whites. Pretty profound stuff when you start to look at it. Not, in 2017, non-Hispanic blacks were 2.3 times more likely to be hospitalized for lower limb amputations as their white counterparts. In 2018, non-Hispanic blacks were twice as likely as non-Hispanic whites to die from diabetes. So you start to look at this pattern of early death. Cardiovascular disparities, you can see um, uh, there are differences, even though every group, um, age-adjusted death rates uh, have improved. African Americans still remain on top. And I want you to notice that as much as the, the danger is we always compare everybody to white people, but that's not the best comparison. As you can see, white people die um, if you uh, have worse uh, outcomes, actually, than Hispanics or Asian Americans. So when we start looking at these health disparities, if you start to pull away from the, the rhetoric of race that the society's all caught up in, you start to realize the people who are most, uh, probably have the longest lineage in America, are the ones who actually die the most. Are you getting that? So there's something about being in America that actually is causing a lot of this disease. Larger shares of black and Hispanic Medicare beneficiaries under age 65 and living with a long-term disability um, uh, compared to white beneficiaries. So you can see if you're under 65 receiving Medicare, the black uh, recipients um, are more likely to have long-term disability. So, they have, so when we talk about this, what we're talking about is it's not just longevity or the length of your life, it's actually the strength of your life, the quality of your life. And what we find is, and I've worked you know, in medicine long enough to go into working around nursing homes, there are a lot of people who are alive for seven years, but they're not living very much, if you get what I'm saying. That's the convalescent stage. And what you want to do is shorten that convalescent stage so that you actually are active all the way up to the end with your red sports car, right? So now, let me, I want to dig into the numbers even more now to show you um, how this works and, and give you some epi on this, uh, some epidemiology. In one study way back in 1990, they reported the death rates per 100,000 for people 35 to 54. So this takes away the violence that might happen in youth, um, it takes away a lot of diseases of the older age, 35 to 54 years. They found that the death rate was 2.3 times higher for African Americans compared to whites. So what did they do? Every, people say, well, black people smoke more, drink more, they're heavier, they have higher blood pressure. So they adjusted it for six risk factors. Smoking, blood pressure, cholesterol, 
BMI or weight, alcohol and diabetes, and still, it decreased from 2.3 to 1.9 times, the death rate was still almost twice as high. When you, when you remove all of those risk factors. They added income, you say, well, black people are poorer, so maybe that's why it happened. Even when you add income, it's still almost one and a half times higher, which leaves about a third of the difference completely unexplained. So poverty control for leaves an excess of 38,000 deaths per year, or 1.1 million years of life lost among African Americans in the United States. This is what we're talking about. And if you're gonna go out and work in the, in the world around health, this is something that you have to understand. Unfortunately, there are people who come into uh, African American neighborhoods to try and share our health message, but because they don't really get this, they're not very effective. You've got to understand what's actually going on and dig a little deeper. So um, it's not income is the point. Heart ills are higher in black doctors. So even when you, you fix for education and you fix for income around just doctors, a study of heart disease in black and white physicians has found that the rate of heart attacks among the black doctors was 10 times higher than that of whites. So, it's, you, see, so you start to see a pattern that even when you fix for a lot of things, nothing works. So we ask a tough question. Why do black Americans live sicker and die sooner? If you can answer this question and correct it for black America, you can correct it for others. I can tell you I worked in the town of Widawi, Alabama. And I saw, it was a predominantly white, poor rural part of, part of Alabama, and I saw early death, we called it, it wasn't just the Bible Belt, we also called it the Kidney Stone Belt. Because there's so many people came in with kidney stones heart attacks and diseases, and they were poor white Americans. And oftentimes this is ignored because it's so much easier to just focus on black America. I pause to say this to show you that in fact there are many groups, uh, Asian Pacific Islanders, especially indigenous populations, also called Native Americans, that all of what I'm telling you also applies. And I don't want you to miss that, right? I can, this is the best example I can use, there's probably the most data on it, but it applies to a lot of different groups. You pull out certain Latino groups, you find the same patterns. And this is one of the things you have to look at. Interesting, when I went to Wadawi to work, um, I went moonlighting. I was doing my family medicine residency in Anniston, Alabama. And so I decided I was going to make some extra money, very Jamaican. So you know, I would have to have an extra job. So I drove down there, and I was working, making good money. It was such a good place to work that when you got to the hospital to do your shift, your check was sitting on the glass. I like that kind of job. When you get paid up front, that's always a good feeling. Right, so I went and I take my check off the wall. I started working that first shift, and some of the nurses came to me and said, "Dr. Walsh, we're glad to have you." I was the only black person in the whole building, except the lady in the cafeteria. And some of the nurses came to me. Young nurses were super cool. They were Alabama fans, but I could forgive them for that. Um, and they they came to me and they said, "You're the first black doctor to ever work here." I said, "Wow, uh, I'm not sure how I should take that. Should I be worried?" They're like, "No," she, they said. The Klan marched here a few weeks ago, but everything's okay. <laughs> I said, what? The Klan? You mean the Ku Klux Klan? They were like, yeah, they marched about three weeks ago. I said, why did the Ku Klux Klan march here? They said, well, a white boy asked a girl who was half white and half black to the prom. And because he asked her to the prom, the Klan marched. I said, oh, no, this ain't good, bro. This, I mean, she, they didn't even go to the prom. He just asked her, and then they marched. So I'm Jamaican, so I said, you know what? I'll take my chances, because that check sticking on the wall is a pretty, pretty big motivator, and I think I'll just take my chances. I remember one night, just to show you how, you know, not all money is good money, but it worked out fine. One night I was working, and a woman, a white uh, Alabama native, was, working, was decided that that night she was going to get in shape. Which night? That night, she hadn't worked out since she was 16. She was 42 years of age. Since she was a cheerleader in high school, she smoked a pack of cigarettes or more a day, ate a typical Southern diet, which I'm going to show you a little bit about the Southern diet in a minute, and had gained some weight since high school. So she went to the gym with her boyfriend and jumped on the treadmill and started it like she was still 16. And she was running full bore on the treadmill. She started having crushing substernal chest pain, sweating, got short of breath, and collapsed on the treadmill and was thrown off onto the floor like an episode from uh, the Jetsons, if you ever remember that cartoon. <laughs> They're laying on the floor, they call 911, ambulance comes, picks her up, and they carry her to the hospital where I'm working. 
I said, boy, that check don't look so good tonight. <laughs> and, I'm, and I said, okay, so we start what we call Mona, for those of you that are going to go to medical school. Morphine, for, uh, for actually for arterial dilation, that's why we give it, to actually decrease the afterload on the heart, so it makes it easier for the heart to pump. It's not really for pain management, even though it doubles as that. Oxygen, of course, nitroglycerin to open up the arteries, and an aspirin. She was, she was still like in and out, so we started all the meds, and when I hooked her up to, we hooked her up to the cardiac monitor, and you looked on the screen, you could see, that's not even the EKG yet, just the monitor, you could see tombstone signs. ST segment elevation is what it is, and looks like a tombstone, so we call it a tombstone sign. And this, so in other words, this woman was dying right in front of me. I'd met a radiologist, or the radiologist, the ra radiology tech, the x-ray tech, who had begun to keep the Sabbath, not because anyone had taught him, he read the Bible and decided the Sabbath was to be kept. So I talked to him and I said, listen, you need to go in the back and pray, right? So he went to the back to pray. I called a cardiologist in Birmingham and I had to give some clot busting medication. I don't remember exactly which one of them I gave, but whatever one they had at the hospital, that little hospital, it was like a 10 bed hospital with two rooms in the ER. It wasn't a big place, it was, which is why the check seemed so nice. <laughs> and so I gave the medicine and the nurse, are you going to give it? I was like, I'm going to give it. Are you going to give it? I'm going to give it. I give the medicine, and the woman within like, yeah, it took about 45 seconds, a minute, I don't remember how long. She went flatline. And at this point, I start to remember, the Klan had just marched. <laughs> and I said, Lord, whatever happens, this woman has to be alive when I leave here tonight. <laughs> I don't care if you have to pull a Lazarus, but this woman has to live if I'm going to get out of this town. So I don't know who she's related to. This woman needs to live. And within a few seconds, she went back to normal sinus rhythm, perfect sinus rhythm. We airlifted her to Birmingham where she spent like I mean, maybe a week in the ICU, CCU, I don't know where, where all she did there. And two weeks later, the lady actually came back, hugged me, and thanked me for saving her life. Let me tell you something. You know the moral of that story? There's power in prayer. That's the moral of the story. <laughs> But I tell you that to tell you that if you, if, you, if you work in healthcare, you will see that this is the discrepancy, the problem that we're describing isn't unique to any one group of people. In fact, it is almost a uniquely American problem now. And what is it that causes people to die sicker and the black people to die sicker and sooner? Stress. Uniquely, stress is what does this. So how do we define stress? Your stress is a condition or a feeling experience when a person perceives that demands exceed the personal and social resources the individual is able to mobilize. Did you get that? Right? So stress means you've got more on your plate than you can manage, and you don't have the resources to get the attorney. You don't have the resources to hire the contractor. You don't have the resources to pay the tuition. Stress is a lack of resources combined with demands. And so the way, the way um, Dr. Batiste and I, we, do our, we have our own podcast, The Slave Food, we talk about this. It's stress equals demands minus resources. And I want to tell you that what the world has done is given you false resources. People think that when they're stressed and they have a glass of wine, they're making things better. And they, they're not, because they're going to mess up their sleep, which they need to uh, blunt the effects of stress. Uh, they think that if I, you know, I'm stressed out and if I have you know, a, a Snickers bar and I feel better, then it's a good thing. That's not, it's a false resource. A cigarette, false resource. Marijuana we talked about today, false resource. All these things are false resources. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are the real and proper resources to help to deal with this? So the, the, the way that our body works, I won't get too deep into the fight or flight response. There's a thing called allostasis that God designed us with, where when we are under stress and are under attack, the body actually changes in order to stay uh, 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 alive. So homeostasis is like the baseline maintenance, but I was, I was walking back from lunch up that steep hill over there. Allostasis is the fact that my heart rate goes up, my, the blood vessels in my big muscles dilate. All these changes happen so that I can maintain stability. Are you getting this? Right? If it didn't change, you couldn't climb a hill or a, or a set of stairs. It would simply never, ever happen. So it's one of the, the, the new medical terms and things that we talk about a lot, allostasis. Allostatic load is when you are so constantly stressed out that you stay in that state. Right? So I joke about this. I grew up in Hartford, and when we would go into the city to stay with my, my grandmother, 
They lived on Simpson Street in Hartford, and my grandfather would give everybody 25 cents back in those days to go to the corner store and buy candy. Except my cousin Brian, he got a dollar, but I'm not upset about that. Not, not, not. I'm still not upset about it. And so we would, in order to get to the store and back during halftime, because it would be like we would be watching football on Sundays usually, we would hop the fence through people's backyards to cut through the block to get to the store fast. The problem in those neighborhoods is if you jump into people's backyards, not careful, what do you find? Dogs. And this was not a California version of dogs. It's, they weren't in bags and they weren't served treats. They were literally the defense system for the house. This was their ADT, right? This was their ring. That was what it was. And so you land in the backyard, and this, job, and this neighborhood is predominantly black and Jamaican. So the poor dog's been eating like rice and peas and collard greens, um, and he's upset <laughs> about his diet. So you land in the backyard. You look like, remember Tom and Jerry? You look like a giant side of beef that just landed in the backyard. We're told that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. And in a moment, allostasis, the fight or flight response, a sympathetic surge happens, you begin to release cortisol and then adrenaline. And even at an early age, your pupils dilate. You don't need to worry about reading the fine print. You need to see where Brutus, this wicked dog is, to make sure it doesn't get you, right? Your heart rate increases to send blood around your body faster. Your blood vessels dilate in your big muscles. Blood is shunted away from your digestive tract to your musculoskeletal system so that you can either run or fight, right? Even the blood vessels, the capillaries on your skin constrict so that if the bite dog does bite you, you bleed less. Fearfully and wonderfully made. And I, that's, that's a few of the changes that actually happen. Your, heart, your, your, your respiratory rate increases. You, you get more blood to the brain. Blood is shunted away from certain parts of the brain to other parts of the brain. All of these things happen in a blink of an eye. And you start running, and that dog can't believe it. Because now you're running like, and I'm going to date myself. Some of you guys don't remember. Like the $6 million man. <laughs> See, all the young people are like, Ooh. he's not in Marvel. Um, and then you jump the fence. And the dog can't even believe how fast you got out of that backyard. You take about four or five breaths on the other side of the back of the fence, and you get up, your heart rate goes back down, and within seconds you're back to normal, you keep walking on to the store. Here's the fundamental problem. If you live in a situation where you are constantly being accosted by a Brutus, it never comes down. And it doesn't have to be a real threat. This is critical to understand. The threat simply needs to be perceived. It changes you because you stay, you move from allostasis to allostatic load. I'm going to tell the young students this so that you get this because this is important. This is why it is so important that you not rush into a long-term romantic relationship. I missed somebody. This is over your head. If you don't marry right... You might marry a Brutus. <laughs> and then you have all that stress. All your, I mean, it's just practical information. It's a free. That's a commercial. Just throwing that one in. Free. The point being, if you can't manage stress, it will kill you. One of the things that stress does is in your liver, it creates something called gluconeogenesis. In other words, your, your, um, your own... Um, your own uh, um, um, liver begins to make sugar. Let's turn this a different way. Um, begins to make sugar. Now here's what's deep. That sugar works just like sugar you consume because it can still go and clog the insulin receptors in your muscle cells so that you don't process sugar well because it turns into fat. It can turn, then turn into fatty acid. But it can do that. It can do all of the bad effects of sugar. It actually can make it so that you're more insulin resistant because you're chronically in this state. This is why these factors show. Chronic exposure to stress, poor social supports, and limited social networks have been shown to increase disease risk. Low perceived control is a determinant of heightened stress responses and poor adaptation. If you don't feel control, so there's a, a great book, I, have, I wish I could remember the name, um, I read it years ago, but it talks about um, the different places in life. So someone who wins awards, like Grammys and stuff, actually lives longer than the Hollywood people who don't, don't ever win any awards. The CEO of a company lives longer than the person in the mail room. You'd say, wait a minute, but the CEO has more stress. But the CEO has decision-making power. 
And that is what makes the difference in actually how you perceive stress. So low perceived control is a problem. Once you start teasing this out, you start to understand why some of the poorer groups, some of the minority, ethnically minority groups are gonna have some of the problems they have. The Interheart study found that psychological stress was a significant modifiable risk factor for acute myocardial infarction, a heart attack. The results showed that individuals with high levels of psychological stress had an approximately two-fold increased risk of AMI compared to those with low levels of stress. The study also found that the relationship between stress and AMI was, just, was independent of other well-established risk factors such as smoking, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and diabetes. I hope you're getting this. And I want to submit to you, our health message, as powerful as it is, if you remain stressed, you actually remove some of its benefits. Stress is a has a unique impact on the risk of heart disease. And so some would argue African-Americans have a unique stressor. This is a one, racism's hidden toll. Um, they talk about impact of racial and ethnic discrimination on the well-being of adolescents, experiences of racial or ethnic discrimination, increased socio-emotional distress, likelihood of engaging in risky health behaviors, increased likelihood of engaging in delinquent activities, lower self-esteem, lower academic achievement and engagement. So I want you to get that it actually tangibly hurts people. One of the reasons I'm a very proud Seventh-day Adventist is that there's only one denomination in the United States that always had an abolitionist stance. That's this one. The, one of the founders of this denomination, a woman named Ellen G. White, wrote a book that if you have not read this book on race, it is advanced by decades to what even is out today. And the book is called The Southern Work. If you've never read the book, every Black History Month, I take quotes from that book and I use it as I go around and speak in this month of February to show people just how profoundly advanced Ellen White was. She sent her own son, a white northerner, post-Civil War in the uh, 1890s, it, down the Mississippi River on a boat called the Morning Star to establish a school to educate former slaves. I want you to understand that that was tantamount to sending your child to be almost lynched because that was still so frowned upon in the Deep South. This is one of the reasons I love my church. Our church has not been perfect on the issue, granted, but I will tell you that in fact our legacy, especially at its origin, is absolutely light years ahead of other denominations. No question about it. So we understood, and if you read the book The Southern Work, Ellen White understood the dangers of what rape, not treating people as equals would cause from a health perspective. Now, let me give you some examples. Women who said they faced racial discrimination on the job and housing from the police were 48% more likely to develop breast cancer than those who reported no incidents of major discrimination. Another study of African-American women found that those who reported chronic emotional stress due to their experience of racism had more severely blocked carotid arteries. Studies showing increased coronary artery calcium scores, is a predictor of having a heart attack, in, patient, in patients with uh, racial uh, discrimination stress was actually higher as well. The telomere, one of the most important things that we actually talk about now with longevity, studies found that black women had shorter telomeres than white women at the same chronological age. Black women had accelerated biological aging by about seven and a half years. Stress literally begins to shorten the telomeres. The telomeres are the caps that you can see in the pictures, like the red area up there. They're like the shoestring caps, the plastic on the tips of your shoestrings. If they unravel, the chromosome begins to unravel and you age faster from a very deep genetic level. You guys getting that? I'll give you a spoiler alert and tell you that the science has only shown that one thing can reverse this. Exercise slows it, prevents it. Uh, hydration does that. Sunshine does that. Um, all of those things do it. Getting proper sleep does that. But only one thing actually changes it so that you restore your telomeres, and that is a whole food, plant-based diet. Nothing else does that. In other words, we, as Adventists, have been sitting on the fountain of youth all this time, as we're going to come back to later on. So I was in Australia at the public health department. They actually had 
old, um, um, this is this from Australia, and they were talking about how uh, racism and uh, what the Aboriginal uh, populations, very profound, and they actually made posters up to talk about the impact that racism can have. And I can tell you, it's, it's very damaging, and it's different. It's something you can't change about yourself. And I remember, and this wasn't a white person that said this to me, this was someone who married into my family, and she, I was 15 years old. I was in her kitchen, and um, uh, I was leaving, and she looked, stopped me, and she looked at me, and she said, you would be so handsome if you weren't so dark. <laughs> you, you, get, you get that? Now, that, that damages you in a different kind of way. It's called colorism, is what it's called. And what it does, though, is you carry that now. So when you look in the mirror, you see what I'm saying? You, it, 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 there's, a, there's a level of stress that becomes inherent to you because you don't look like the societal standard of beauty. You're not accepted. You, know, you walk into somewhere, people recoil. People are afraid of you inherently because the news disproportionately shows black people committing crimes, disproportionate to even the actual crimes they commit, is what the studies show. And so you have to carry that around. And here, again, is an opportunity for the church that Ellen White understood. You can actually reach people in these hurting places, not only lengthen their life, but show them the love of Jesus. And that's one of the reasons I love our church. Our church is such a diverse denomination. The church I attend, we have people from Romania, Russia, all over Africa, the West Indies, Jamaica, all over the States, all kinds of people. The church is, is very diverse. And I like that about our church. Because when I get to heaven, that's what I'm going to see. Right? So there's a great book written, and this is a, a Jewish author, Richard Rothstein, one of the most brilliant um, writers on the subject of race and racism, a book called The Color of Law. If you haven't ever read this book, it will blow your mind that the government actually conspired with developers to segregate America. And I'm not talking about the South. I'm talking about places like Levittown, Long Island, and the Bay Area of California. That, in fact, Americans all lived amongst each other for a long time before there was like an intentional effort to segregate the country and redline certain neighborhoods. And where they left black people, they dropped the property values, raised the rents, and took away the ability to generate generational wealth. So the higher our stress, the poorer our health. And that's the one thing we know. And it doesn't really matter what causes this damage of of, 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 of what causes the stress, it damages our health. But then that leads to something else, and we call it nutritional stress. So you guys have probably seen this at Weimar, but stress spelled backwards is desserts. <laughs> I've said this on, I probably Columbus and I have both said this on Chef AJ's show, um, but stress spelled backwards is desserts. When you are stressed out, literally the food you crave changes. Fatty, salty, sugary foods, comfort foods is how we describe it, actually feel better. They taste better. You crave them more. Why? Because it plugs directly into the cortisol release, plugs directly into the adrenaline. It actually makes you feel you're getting more energy faster. There's a dopaminergic release because these foods have been industrially designed by the food companies to be addictive. So it touches on you in a whole lot of ways. So when you're, when you're sitting there stressed out and someone lays down a, you know, a honey bun on one side or, or a plate of bro broccoli on the other one, Broccoli just don't seem like it's going to do something that much for your stress, right? That honey bun with a glass of milk seems like it's going to do a whole lot more. Stress equals desserts spelled backwards. And nutritional stress happens when you're eating the disease-forming foods and not eating the health-promoting foods. So hey, so let's step back. If you create high-stress areas, so I'm going to name two. One of them, urban inner-city America. And the other one I've already mentioned, rural, predominantly white, and Native American, rural America. Both places, lower jobs, lower incomes, harder lives. And what we know in the cities is that after the riots of the 60s, like 1968, you can see how America was hit by these urban riots. Some of you may remember that. Uh, President Nixon actually came together and he said any act of racism is an act of communism. He started to realize that if you don't fix the problems, the communists are going to get a foothold in America because black ch young people and others, Latinos, Native Americans, if they feel disenfranchised, they're going to be far more likely to hold to Marxist ideology. 
The Black Panther Party, which started right here in California, not far from here in the Bay Area, actually they made their money by selling Mao Zedong's um, Red Book in California. Interesting, huh? So Nixon picked that up and said, we've got to fight this. And so what did he do? He created a small business loan association that still exists today to go back in and give low income, low interest loans to redevelop inner city. The problem is when you went back in to do this, you found that grocery stores actually have a very slim profit margin per product. But there's another food uh, uh, industry that has very high profit margins. Who are they? Fast food. So what happened? Well, uh, Jin Chow, if you've not read this book, she was on our podcast, she's brilliant. She's Australian. Um, she wrote this book, Supersizing Urban America, How Inner Cities Got Fast Food with Government Help. So they, it, all of a sudden, it poured into um, urban America. And what happens are things that you'll hear people talk about, food uh, deserts and food um, swamps. Right? So if you go to certain urban areas, you see McDonald's, then you see Kentucky Fried Chicken. Out of the street in Pasadena, on the poor side of Pasadena, there was a Louisiana Fried Chicken, a Kentucky Fried Chicken, and a Popeye's Fried Chicken, all within walking distance of each other. Right? And so, I wish I had real time to get into this, but the government is complicit. Because how does a salad cost more than a Big Mac? It is because we have decided to subsidize the bad food. So Chef AJ actually made some great points about SOS. The sugar and the oils are subsidized by the government. The processed foods, the soy, the massive GMO soy fields that have taken over, um, to that make um, the, the oils that we see, the massive corn fields that make corn oil and, and high fructose corn syrup, as, as uh, the byproducts of other things are so profitable, the government, I'm reading a book called Metonomics now, I wish I'd finished it by now so I could put some of this in it, but it's blowing my mind when you look at how the government not only subsidizes the bad foods, including meat and dairy, so that when you buy a hamburger, you're actually buying something that tax dollars have subsidized. The cheese, even the advertising for the cheese. That's why you look at pizza. You ever see these new pizza commercials? They don't just put cheese on pizza anymore. They put cheese inside the crust of the pizza. That's just evil. <laughs> right? That's just wrong. That's not right. I mean, how could that be right? With everything we know about cheese. So the government is complete. I want you to get that. So even when they give you a food pyramid, you see, um, uh, the federal su subsidies for food production, uh, you see, that, see it here, meat and dairy, 73.8. This is what they recommend. They recommend you eat only this orange part of meat and dairy. You see that? But then they subsidize this much. That's called hypocrisy. That you would tell America to eat less meat and cheese, but then subsidize the mass production. And I wish I had the slide of Ronald Reagan. I have a great slide of Ronald Reagan holding up um, government cheese. Now, most of you in here probably have no idea what government cheese is. But government cheese was very popular in a lot of the neighborhoods I used to live in. My mother never got any government help, so I never saw it in my house. But I saw it at some of my aunt's house. It was a block of cheese about this big, and it didn't work like regular cheese. You cut it, and you melted it, and it didn't melt. It just kind of bubbled. It was a weird thing. I found out later on that the way that they got this cheese is that when they gave the best milk and the best parts of the, of the whole milking process to make Velveeta and some of the really good brands, quote unquote, of cheese, the waste, the leftover fat, was actually made into government cheese. <laughs> and that was then given to poor people in Guam, Puerto Rico, Indian reservations, rural America, and the ghettos of America. I want you to get that. So here you had a block of saturated fat cholesterol, and salt that we were handing out willy-nilly all across the country. I used to work with the WIC program as a health officer and director of a health department. These are literally the government subsidized bottle feeding and formula feeding over breastfeeding. We now know that's one of the worst things you could actually do to a child, is to not give them, if it's at all possible, the child should be nursed. Because there are formula formulations, I talked about this on Chef AJ's show, uh, either this year or last year, I don't remember which one of our shows it was. Um, but we, we, there's more, so there are formula, formula, formula uh, formulations that have more sugar than soda. 
and you're giving it to a brand new baby. Then you wonder why it's so hard for people to lose weight, so hard for people, and if the mother has been stressed during her pregnancy, you actually lay down more fat cells in utero, the baby actually lays down more fat cells, then they come out and you feed the fat cells with the sugar and the formula, then of course once they can eat, the first thing you hand them is a Pop-Tart, and then there's breakfast cereal. I want you to get that literally you are, all of us have been fighting an uphill battle, most of us, if you're born in this country and you're fed the typical American diet. It's very challenging. And so you get these food deserts. Food, fast food is a $170 billion industry. There's evidence that they actually disproportionately advertise in poorer neighborhoods and rural white neighborhoods out in the country, as well as in inner city black and brown neighborhoods. They also actually uh, advertise the toys more, they showed in one study, in a Happy Meal, more in poorer neighborhoods than in other ones. It's, and, I mean, it's really interesting because they make so much money doing this. Why is that relevant? Well, there's a study that showed fast food availability is linked with more heart attacks. Just the availability of it in a neighborhood means the collective rate of heart attacks in that neighborhood goes up. That simple. So we say, da da da, I'm loving it. No, it, it, it's actually killing you. <laughs> so we call all of this slave food. This is why our project is called the Slave Food Project, because what they've done is they figured out a way to design food to be addictive. That's why they say, bet you can't eat just one. The tobacco industry said, listen, our stuff is not addictive. It doesn't cause disease. It doesn't cause cancer. Don't blame us if people die from tobacco. The food industry said, bet you can't eat just one. Once you pop, you can't stop. That's what they said. <laughs> right? They exploit. Remember the dopaminergic pathways in the brain we talked about? The food industry learned how to hijack it and create foods that are hyper palatable, meaning they're super tasty, Super stimulating. The word that Ellen White uses in the book um, Councils on Diets and Foods is simple. Simple. And I never understood what that meant until I really dug into this. It means food that is not processed, that is not hyper palatable, that is not overly made so that you can't stop eating it. They've manufactured addiction. Here's the New York Times. Is junk food really cheaper is the question the New York Times is asking. Why? Because they, they were making food that triggers addiction like neuroaddictive responses. Very profound that in fact, what you, when you open a bag of hot Cheetos, what you're actually doing is eating the equivalent of edible crack. The cheese, the salt, the sugar, the way you can't, I see kids come in with, every week, when I was at Loma Linda, they come every week with, at, our, at our urgent care there, when I was working there, every week this kid would come in hand, uh, with, um, with cold, every other week, he's always sick, and I was like, why is your child, so, then I looked at his hand, his hand stained red. I said, why is his hand so red? Is he playing with paint? That's from the hot Cheetos. The mother said he will only eat hot Cheetos. The dye in some of these foods alone is actually pretty dangerous. So I want you to understand that when they do this, they damage you. So health equals resiliency. This is the second equation you get over stress. So you have, the more resilient you become and the lower your stress is, the healthier you're going to be. How do you become resilient? Ha! Ah, the answer to the health disparity question, the answer to the stress question, is all wrapped up in something you guys do better than probably anybody in the world right here at Weimar. It's to teach lifestyle. It is new start. That's literally what it is. The evidence for that is overwhelming, and it is a, a, a miscarriage of academic justice. That people graduate from medical school and aren't taught what you guys are taught and live and practice here, and probably some of you take for granted. And I'm going to show you why it's so important. So we know that there are foods that actually fight stress. Cruciferous vegetables, one of the most important things that you could eat. Certain spices, like turmeric, are very good. Dark chocolate, uh, and I don't, don't promote chocolate, but there are those who argue it. Legumes and then fermented foods. Now, foods that fight disease and improve a quality of life. I won't go too deep in this. You guys probably talk about this stuff here enough. Uh, green leafy vegetables, right? Compared to participants in the lowest intake quintile, uh, a moderate vegetable nitrate intake was associated with 15% lower risk of cardiovascular disease. Moderate vegetable intake was associated with 12, 15, 17, and 26% lower risk of ischemic heart disease, heart failure, ischemic stroke, and peripheral artery disease hospitalizations. Consumptions of at least about 60 milligrams a day of vegetable nitrate 
uh, about a cup of green leafy vegetables a, a day may mitigate the risk of coronary vascular disease. Greens. Simple. I mean, nothing fancy, just greens. Inexpensive, relatively. And more importantly, you can grow it yourself. Whole grains. Each serving of whole grain is associated with a 5% decrease in all-cause mortality, 9% decrease in cardiovascular disease mortality. Beans, and I'm, I'm really, this is all very 30,000 foot, just going through this quick. Legume consumption four times more or more per week compared with less than a, once a week was associated with a 22% lower risk of um, uh, CHD and 11% lower risk of CVD. So just beans, and this is what Daniel ate when it says he ate pulse, this pulse was lentils. He ate beans, nuts. And this is Dr. Sabate at, at Loma Linda University, did a lot of this research. Meta-analysis, 20 prospective cohort studies, the highest versus the lowest nut consumption, all-cause mortality, 19% lower, cardiovascular mortality, 27% lower. I talked about spices. The evidence does suggest that the use of culinary herbs and spices may have beneficial effects on risk factors for CBD. And this is where Chef AJ talks about you can make the food taste good. Here's the secret. You can make it taste good and actually add nutritional value to it. I love this study. Your brain on blueberries enhances memory with the right foods. I'm sure you guys have heard of the study where they gave up one group of kids no blueberries before school, one group got a cup of blueberries before school, and the other cup, uh, group got two cups of blueberries before school. The group that got two cups of blueberries before school did better than the group that got one, and they did better than the ones that got none. Just eating blueberries before you go to school will enhance school performance, as will getting enough sleep and being hydrated. And here's the dietary patterns, the southern diet, increased risk of heart failure, a plant-based diet, decreased risk of heart failure. Some of the other things about lifestyle that are important is to remember that exercise also protects against stress. So you guys just walking around this campus, you get some good exercise. New report, exercise plays key role in mental health and well-being. Physical activity counteracts stress by increasing endorphins supporting cognitive function and altering blood flow to stress-affected areas of the brain. Exercise also shifts us into the present moment, focusing our attention on what we're doing right now rather than worrying about the future. Uh, physical activity reduces stress. The effects of exercise intensity on the cortisol response to a subsequent acute psychosocial stressor. This study I want you guys to focus on. This one blew my mind. This one is a very important study. What they found is that exercise actually protects you against a future stressful event. Now watch this. When following vigorous exercise, the HPA, and this is the hypothalamus pituitary axis, reactivity to a stressor is dampened compared to when following moderate light activity. When following moderate exercise, HPA activity to a stressor is dampened compared to light activity. Cortisol released in response to exercise is inversely related to cortisol released in response to the psychosocial stressor. The more you exercise, you literally develop resilience, you, resel you develop a buffer so that when a real life stressor hits you, your HPA does not overreact. In other words, you don't get that massive allostatic load, that massive fight or flight response. Exercise blunts it in advance. The reason to exercise isn't to lose weight. The reason to exercise is to make it so that you don't get hit by stress the same way. The study revealed that exercise dampens the HPA access response in a dose-dependent manner with evidence that the cortisol release from exercising intensely suppresses the subsequent cortisol response to a psychosocial stressor. That is powerful. That's lifestyle. So if you live in poor inner city neighborhoods where you're not, it's not safe to go outside and people hide inside because of the crime and other things, they don't get the exercise they should, and on top of that you add in all the other stressors, you start to see why life expectancy would be shortened. But the other one that is important is trust in God. It's one of the most important parts of New Start. And it says, Proverbs 17 says, a merry heart does good like a medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. What does the science say? Well, religious faith can lead to positive mental benefits, writes a Stanford anthropologist. Science says religion is good for your health. Pretty profound, huh? That's from Forbes. There's ample reason to believe that faith in a higher power is associated with health 
and in a positive way. For example, researchers at the Mayo Clinic concluded, most studies have shown that religious involvement and spirituality are associated with better health outcomes, including greater longevity, coping skills, and health-related quality of life, even during terminal illness, and less anxiety, depression, and suicide. Several studies have shown that addressing the spiritual needs of the patient may enhance recovery from illness. And you know what we're told now? Not to address spirituality with patients. I'm glad I went to Loma Linda because they taught us to take a spiritual history, to ask people how they were, were raised, what do they believe, so that you get an, a sense of it because it's actually important. So there's some who've looked at the health benefits of the Christian faith. Um, some teach that religion is for the hesitant, the guilt-ridden, the excessively, ex excessively timid, those lacking clear convictions with, with, the, which to face, with, with which to face life. That's what a standard British textbook of psychiatry said until 1969. The implication is clear. Faith selects the weak and is probably bad for your health. Sigmund Freud went so far as to call it a neurosis. Here's what the science says. Evidence from over 1,200 studies and 400 reviews have shown an association between faith and a number of positive health benefits, including protection from illness, coping with illness, and faster recovery from it. Of the studies reviewed in the, in the definitive analysis, 81 showed benefit and only 4% harm. The raw data from some large studies show a significant benefit in mortality for those involved in organized religion. And this is literally what they're telling people to stay away from. For instance, one study followed 21,000 plus representative American adults over nine years and correlated death rates with religious activity and a large range of other data. Income and education had surprisingly little impact. Watch this, church. But those who attended church regularly had a life expectancy seven years longer than those who did not. And here's where health disparities comes in again. For black people, the benefit was 14 years. I told you this morning that the people leaving the church the fastest are black Americans. The researchers attributed to the benefit to more protective relationships, including marriage, and to healthier behaviors. Now, I won't get into this guy. This is Bill Maher. He mocks you know, church and Sunday school, does all kinds of things. Many people think that if you're religious, you're actually more crazy. But in a majority of studies, religious involvement is correlated with well-being, happiness, and life satisfaction, hope, and optimism purpose and meaning in life, rather uh, uh, um, uh, purpose in life, higher self-esteem, better adaptation to bereavement, greater social support and less loneliness, lower rates of depression and faster recovery from depression, lower rates of suicide and fewer positive attitudes towards suicide. Did you get that? Fewer positive attitudes toward it. Less anxiety, less psychosis and fewer psychotic tendencies, lower rates of alcohol and drug abuse, less delinquency and criminal activity, greater marital stability and satisfaction. Yet. This is one of the things a lot of people like to erase from society. Bill Maher is one of them. This is the conclusion of the largest literature review and is endorsed by a former president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, a British study. He laments, look at this is what they, in the British, in the UK, this is what they say. He laments the lack of attention given to the strong evidence for anything other than religion, evidence for anything other than religion and spirituality, governments and health providers would be doing their utmost to promote it. So we know that the trust in God, the T, one of the T's in New Start, is actually very powerful. In a world of stress, in a stress, trusting God is healthy. Does it impact these health disparities? Attending church might lengthen black men's lives. As we're watching this exodus from churches, they're saying that, in fact, we're walking away from something that would make us healthy. Does this work? Well, you guys have read, the, many of you have heard of the book, the, uh, the Blue Zones. There are five Blue Zones in the world. How many of them are in North America? You know where it is? Loma Linda, California. The most centenarians in the world are in these five places, and Loma Linda has one of them. In fact, I'll show you the episode when Bill Moore says, but what, what does it? And you can see here, Loma Linda, this is Sardinia, Okinawa, Japan, the other two places, one of them is in uh, Costa Rica, and one of them is in Ikara in Greece. Um, and you can see here, this, it overlaps, whole grains, culturally isolated, high soy consumption, no alcohol, faith, uh, health, social circle, eat nuts, family, no smoking, plant-heavy diet, constant moderate physical activity, social engagement, legumes. One thing they leave out of the Loma Linda group is... The Sabbath. 
There's a great, I don't know if you guys saw this TikTok, but there's, there's a, a, a pastor who's not Adventist who did a whole thing on the fact that Adventists live 11 years longer. So what he did was, you guys saw this? What he did was he took um, how many Sabbaths, he said the Seventh-day Adventists live long, 11 years longer. He went and he, he took the average life expectancy of 76 years or whatever it is in America. He calculated how many Sabbaths that would equal out to, multiplied that by 24 hours, and came up with exactly 11 years. There's power in keeping the Sabbath. And listen, I've got a lot of stuff going on in my life. I'm so happy on Friday evening to just be like, eh, whatever happens now happens for the next 24 hours. If they, if I forgot to pay the bill. It just got forgot because uh, I'm not thinking about it for a while. When Bill Maher, and this is the actual clip from, when, uh, from his show on HBO, um, and I, I saw this, I actually went and watched this episode. This is the gentleman who wrote the book, um, The Blue Zones. And I, I forget his name is slipping me. Dan Buettner, brilliant guy. And when Bill Maher asked Dan Buettner, um, he asked him, he says, he, he, first of all, Bill Maher is all excited about the blue zones. And he, then he says, wait a minute, how is it that there's one blue zone in Southern California? He says, in fact, it's only like 40 minutes from here, Loma Linda. He's like, how's that possible? And he says, and, and, and Dan Buettner says, they are Seventh-day Adventists. And you know what uh, Bill Maher does? He slams his pen down and almost says he's going to walk away and quit his show. Because he hates, he's, he's a very avid atheist, if you ever watch his show. He made the documentary Religious to mock people who are religious. So he's very angry. And Dan Buettner, to his credit, well, I have great respect for the guy, he begins to explain to Bill Maher our health message starting in Genesis 1.29. And the more he quotes the scripture to him, the more angry Bill Maher gets. <laughs> because when you think about it, if for those of you who have never been in Loma Linda, what you got to understand is California, if you leave California, California is literally the quintessential headquarters of fast food in the world. You've got fast food joints here that people actually come to California just to eat, <laughs> like in and out Burger which is neither in nor out, because they make a line down the road. You got to mess up the traffic. Right? I, I, my, one of, my, one of, one of my, my brother's good friends out in Miami, they, he sells, he has clothing stores, they hip-hop stores. He would come to, he would fly to Las Vegas for one of the big hip-hop clothing shows. He would make sure he stopped in L.A. on his way home just to get an In-N-Out burger. That's why Bill Maher is so shocked, because McDonald's, the biggest name in fast food in the world started only a few minutes from Loma Linda in San Bernardino, California. The McDonald's brothers started in San Bernardino, 10 minutes from Loma Linda. For the longest, there was no McDonald's in Loma Linda. I think there is now. Unfortunate, right? But I want you to get the fact that when Bill Moore saw this, he was angry because the evidence of the only thing that can maintain health in the um, health hostile environment of America is our health message. That is profound. And one of the things that I think is really important, I want to end um, with just a quote from that book, The Southern Work, because we talked a lot about race and racism and stuff. Our health message works. So I, I, can, I mean, the science is overwhelming on it, um, and you're watching more and more people move towards it. Chef AJ said something very profound earlier that a lot of us, a lot of people are getting into the vegan diet for ethical reasons, they don't want to harm animals, that is a beautiful thing, I think. I think it does protect the environment, that's a beautiful thing. But ultimately, what good is it to protect animals and the environment if you're not protecting yourself? And our health message actually teaches that, and it's one of the most important things um, to understand. And it means you almost have to disconnect from the world from a culinary standpoint. And that's difficult. Very difficult, especially for those of us who are super busy. That, it's almost, it seems almost impossible, but it's almost this, that's the secret sauce. you got to get away. So I'll leave you with this quote from this book, uh, Southern Work, page 12. The black man's name is written in the book of life beside the white man's. All are one in Christ. Birth, station, nationality, or color cannot elevate or degrade men. The character makes the man. The day is coming when the kings and the lordly men of the earth would be glad to exchange places with the humblest African who has laid hold on the hope of the gospel. Amen. I want to leave you with that because I, our church has a legacy of equality and fairness 
and service, hospitals that saw pay all kinds of patients, hospitals in the, some of the darkest corners of the world, schools in some of the poorest places on the planet. Are, are, we have gone where others would, would fail to go. And hence, we have the second largest hospital system in the world and the second largest parochial school system in the world. And yet, we are just a fraction, a small, small fraction of the, who has the number one systems. And I want to submit to you, again, my last appeal here at Weimars, especially to the students and the young people. You have been called to carry that legacy, to carry it the way it was initiated. Like that Morning Star boat that went down the Mississippi River into hostile territory, and because of it, I was educated at the school that Ellen White's son started. To this day, it is one of the schools in America that produces the most black doctors, to this day. That's the legacy. And we ought not forget that legacy. It is a powerful legacy. And when, as the world becomes more divided, let the people of God become more united. And let them show, show the world that the love of Christ is different. It changes things. We no longer see each other because of where we come from or what language we speak. We see each other as Christ sees us. Sinners in need of grace. And as we grow in Christ, characters to be molded to be like him. That is the power of the gospel.